Welcome, welcome, welcome. Here at Are You Dumber Than a Liberal, we pit the finest minds and their claims against what I can find with some basic internet research skills. Today's contestant is a man you know him well, a king amongst flannel wearers everywhere, with a beard like no other, Mr. Matt Walsh. Matt, I just have to say, you carry the serial killer glasses choice far better than me. So we're going to start you off with one point. All right. Already in the lead for your first question, how many times have climate activists been wrong? Now, it's common knowledge at this point that pretty much every prediction that's ever been made by climate activists has turned out to be completely false. Ouch. Man, starting off with balancing the board. There's examples of data modeling starting in the 1970s and for 40 years now that have been highly accurate. Predictions that sea levels would rise, another one that's been accurate, and of course CO2 influencing this all with our started detections in the late 1950s. But I want to give you another chance, Matt. If you had to call on one activist to quote, to bring this back to a winning game, who would that be? And there are a lot of examples of this phenomenon. There's uh, Leonard Nimoy, aka Mr. Spock, claiming in a 1978 television special that, quote, during the lifetime of our grandchildren, Arctic cold and perpetual snow could turn most of the inhabitable portions of our planet into a polar desert. Now, that TV special was called The Coming Ice Age, and of course, by the time Mr. Spock's prediction was falsified, uh, he was near death, so no one was going to hold him accountable or say, I told you so, when he was on his deathbed, which I guess is sort of understandable. That is unexpected. From the undiscovered country itself, Matt is calling in an expert from left field, Leonard Nimoy. Let's take a peek at this 1978 TV special gem. There is little doubt that someday the ice will return. At least eight times in the past million years, it has advanced and retreated with clockwork regularity. If we are unprepared for the next advance, the result could be hunger and death on a scale unprecedented in all of history. What scientists are telling us now is that the threat of an ice age is not as remote as they once thought. During the lifetime of our grandchildren, Arctic cold and perpetual snow could turn most of the inhabitable portions of our planet into a polar desert. Amazing! Mr. Spock himself thrown under the bus and Matt gets another point. It is accurate that Leonard Nimoy was a climate activist by Matt's definition, and he did say these things. To be clear, the TV special was not indicating that this ice age was from human-caused climate change, just the natural change of the climate. In fact, by the end of the film, a climatologist is explaining why byproducts from human technology and human intervention could cause the glaciers to melt and flood coastal cities. But... Matt didn't call on him. Smart move, sir. Smart move. All right, I can see we're going to be in for a wild ride. Matt, who's next on your list to wield that grim, nearly no expression facial forest at? Then there was that infamous 1989 article from the Associated Press citing a senior UN environmental official saying that, quote, Entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if the global warming trend is not reversed by the year 2000. Now again, they're putting some distance between the prediction and the time when you can prove that the prediction was wrong. Matt, you are at two points versus the one for me, and I have to say the confidence you have with your quote is rather convincing. Unfortunately for you, Matt, the UN official wasn't claiming that by the year 2000, everyone would be wiped off the face of the earth. They were claiming that there was a limited time to stop that conclusion from happening sometime in the future. As in, a turning point. No, no, wait. A tipping point. This is made even more clear in the article when he warns about the 1 to 7 degrees that would be a global increase of temperature over the next 30 years. No one would care if they were all dead. So Matt, you've brought me up to two by using an actor and a lawyer. Who's your third example of a climate activist? A NASA scientist did the same thing in 2006 when he told NBC News that, quote, the world has a 10-year window of opportunity to take decisive action on global warming and avert catastrophe. 
Ooh, a scientist. Let's dig into his 2006 know-how. Way to go, Matt. You are now at three points to my two, taking the lead again with a technicality. Yes, that quote is accurate. And yes, that scientist did say it. He also included a false prediction, I hate to say. He thought the world would raise in temperature by two to three degrees Celsius by this point. And it's only raised 1.13, narrowly outside of his window. But all of his other predictions that he made were far more close to being accurate. But your quote was correct. You're so good with saying so little to let yourself get away with being right when you know you're wrong. I love it. I wish I could grow your beard and staple it to my face. Next on the chopping block is... More recently, of course, Greta Thunberg got in on the action in 2018 when she uh, claimed that, quote, a top climate scientist is warning that climate change will wipe out all of humanity unless we stop using fossil fuels over the next five years. Matt, Matt, Matt. It's another unfortunate misreading of the sentence. The quote is accurately attributed to Greta from a screen grab of her 2018 post that she made and deleted. The quote is saying that if we don't stop using fossil fuels over the next five years, then all of humanity will be wiped out without giving a date on that part of the equation. To go a bit further, the article in question was misquoted by Greta as the scientist hasn't, from any record, said that exact thing. He indicated that all of the polar ice caps will be on their way to melting if we hadn't stopped by 2023, and that we'd be headed towards a future with them melting entirely due to warming feedback loops that many people talk about. Matt, just taking a step back here, how are you feeling about your answers so far with regards to climate activists having predictions that are close to true or just, you know, true? Now, in all these cases, the climate predictions weren't even close to being true. Reality disproved all of them. But it took time for these predictions to age out and become clearly false. Hold on, hold on. I don't want to get in an argument here. I think we got off on a wrong foot. In many of these examples, the people you are quoting were telling you when to take action by to avert a future catastrophe, not when the catastrophe was going to happen exactly. But I want to take a moment to get more personal with you, you know, sidestep this discussion for a bit. Just share your story, man. Let's start here. What would you say is really the defining trait that shows Catholics are as smart cultists versus climate change activists as dumb ones? despite them both having an apocalyptic claim of the future. Most cultists are smart enough to design their claims so that they sound highly alarming at the time, and then by the time that you can validate those claims years later, most people have forgotten about the whole thing, and they've moved on to making different claims that are farther in the future still. Interesting take on your own religion. But I digress. Back to the climate. Let's move away from activists. What is something you think is clearly incorrectly presented by climate change scientists? Now, we've already established in the past that, uh, of course, it, it was never going to be true that it's the hottest year on record. That's an absurd claim. Uh, or even, you know, what they've actually said is it's the hottest year period for the planet Earth, which even if that was true, there'd be no possible way to, uh, to, to verify that because we don't have records of what the temperature was on a daily basis going back thousands and millions of years. But if you try to fact check that claim from John Kerry, you'll find a bunch of articles declaring that he was right. They'll say this is indeed the hottest year ever. And that's uh, and it's all because Mother Earth doesn't like your truck or your grill or the way you vote. I have to say, looking these articles up, they simply don't imply what you have said. They are saying that it's the hottest day in human recorded history. That could be since humans first started recording daily temperatures in the 1850s, as some articles mention, or in other articles since humankind has been around. This one still doesn't feel like a win for me, so I'm going to ask a follow-up question. What are we missing here? What would make your claim true? None of these articles will mention the recent volcanic eruption in the Pacific Ocean, 
which we've talked about, that blasted a huge plume of water vapor into the atmosphere. They won't tell you how that likely trapped heat and raised the global temperatures. Instead, they'll blame you for all the heat. Well, I have to say that is rather fascinating to look up. But with a basic search, even, I could find articles that mentioned the volcano relatively all over the place. They do mention increasing temperatures because water vapor is a greenhouse gas, but from its output would have been responsible for less than one-tenth of one degree for this year's global temperature. And that's only because, unlike normal volcanoes, where water vapor eventually rains down on us or falls to snow, this volcano kept producing vapor for an extended period of time. Otherwise, the temperature increases only last for a few days to a few weeks before it comes right back down in rain. It's still anyone's game, and it sounds like you may be running out of steam. Did you want to change the topic from greenhouse gases and move on to, say, weather? Temperatures in Siberia dip to minus 56 Celsius as record snow blankets Moscow in the Russian capital. Some of the biggest snowfalls ever seen on, seen on December 3rd left swaths of Moscow blanketed in drifts of more than 35 centimeters of snow in just one day. Now, most of uh, Central and Eastern Europe was uh, like that last week. They've never seen snow like this in recorded history. This is supposedly the hottest year ever recorded and they're experiencing record snowfall. Well now, that Reuters article that you yourself read calls out temperatures colder than minus 50 degrees Celsius have been recorded less and less in recent years thanks to climate change. But not that it was never possible before or since. And in addition to that, man, you were on the verge of the answer for the snowfall just moments ago with the volcano. As the global temperature heats up, air is able to carry more water, which is how humidity works. Bigger storms then occur, whether they are rain, hurricanes, or snow. Sorry, Matt, this one wasn't even close. I would like to ask, though, if there was one thing that shows that many of the liberal politicians aren't serious about this, what would it be? So private jets are frozen on their way to the climate summit where the owners of the jets want to lecture you about the evils of global warming. You know, that is a fair point, Matt, and I fully agree. They couldn't be bothered to take a train or commercial flights that can be arguably less impactful on the climate and instead are flying around a few passengers per jet at a time? Great point. And you're on a roll. What's another thing people say but don't fully grasp how it could be good? Warming climates is always a bad thing, even though it often makes it easier to farm in huge portions of the world and has many other benefits, but never mind that. That's another great point. Uh, even though the long-term effects of continually warming Earth would be bad for human life, you are right. There are some advantages conveyed along the way from longer growing seasons, sea passageway openings, and more. Excellent. What's something you wish people would stop saying? And why? Weather is different from climate. Just because you have a snowstorm doesn't mean the warming isn't happening. That's an important line, and again, a very familiar one. We hear this all the time now, that weather is not the same as climate. So when they talk about climate change, you can't, it's not about weather. But that's totally false, of course. The, the, the uh, literal dictionary definition of climate is the weather conditions prevailing in, a, in an area in general over a long period. That, so that's, climate is the prevailing weather conditions. That's what the climate is. So saying that weather is different from climate. It's like saying water is different from H2O. It just doesn't even make any sense. And to the extent that it does make sense, it's not true. Interesting. This one has a few separate claims. You are saying that weather is different from climate, provided a definition, and then make a straight out of left field science analogy. Let's start with where you get it right. Climate is the prevailing weather conditions of an area over a long period of time. Weather, however, is not the same thing as climate as weather references the moment, today, current state, kind of information. A quick example would be it snowed in Austin, Texas. That's the weather. But you wouldn't call it the climate of Austin to be cold and snowy. You would, for say many parts of Alaska or Canada, rainy and hurricane-y for Florida. 
The analogy is pretty bad though, because you say, this is like saying water is different from H2O. But it's more like saying a drop of water is different than rain. Rain is made up of a multitude of drops of water, but to say it's the same thing as a single drop of water would be incorrect. Just like climate is made up of a multitude of daily weather events, but it still isn't the same thing. You got the definition correct, I'll give you a point for that. You got the analogy wrong and the truth of the matter incorrect. I don't want to be harsh here, so we'll just stay even, alright? What's the next topic, dealer's choice? This is how it's gone, from ice age to global warming to climate change, getting broader and less specific with each change. According to NASA, quote, global warming became the dominant popular term in June 1988 when NASA scientist James E. Hansen had testified to Congress about climate, specifically referring to global warming. But then people started to notice that it was getting colder than it had ever been before. In 1994, for example, the Midwestern and Eastern portions of the country experienced a cold wave that caused more than 100 deaths. The country saw its coldest temperatures in nearly a century. So once again, the lexicon had to change. As CNN reports, the term climate change, quote, became more popular in the 2000s. The point of all these changes isn't just to save face. With every change, activists give themselves more latitude to justify all of their other political goals in the name of saving the environment. All right, Matt. We are getting long in the tooth here, so I'm going to try and make it quick. 1994 was seen as still proof of being part of a larger warming trend globally, not a cooling. And at the time was listed as one of the three warmest years on record, and by months had March to December as the warmest observed in the historical record. But nice dodge with focusing it just on the US. As for climate change, entering the lexicon, that wasn't because of something nefarious. In the 1980s and beyond, a term global change was attempted to be used, which was mentioned in that very same article from NASA you quoted so conveniently from the end. Both terms were trying to showcase that heat was the least problematic feature of climate change, which they even knew in the 1980s. But alas, global change wasn't as catchy. That's a loss for you, Matt. What's next? At the COP28 summit the other day, John Kerry pledged to uh, shut down all coal power plants anywhere in the world, except presumably China, which is constantly opening new coal plants every week, and which doesn't uh, remotely care what John Kerry says about anything. Now, John Kerry's plan would destroy the world economy. It would do precisely nothing to stop the climate from changing, because the climate is always going to change. But you're supposed to think that uh, it's a reasonable thing to do because we're in a climate emergency. Everything's on the table. Wow, John Kerry thrown under the bus. Not as bad as throwing Leonard Nimoy there, but I'm gonna make this quick. John Kerry pledged to phase out coal power plants in the US, not in the world. And no date was specified. China doesn't care about their pledge, that we can agree on, and continues to open power plants every week. Last I checked, Literally. And there's definitely something to the economies of those places being damaged terribly by an immediate closure of coal plants, which no one is suggesting. And I'll still give you that one, since it's actually not talked about too much. But you really are being a coal alarmist here about its magnitude right now. Since we're talking about global warming though, pop quiz. Which kills more, extreme heats or extreme colds? Extreme cold kills far more people than extreme heat. Just to give one data point, according to The Lancet, there were roughly 800 deaths due to heat in England and Wales between 2000 and 2019. By contrast, there were more than 60,000 deaths associated with extreme cold. And Forbes reports that in this country, quote, the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics Compressed Mortality Database, which is based on actual death certificates, indicates that roughly twice as many people die of cold in a given year than of heat. This is kind of obvious when you think about it. Someone, who, someone exposed to cold can develop hypothermia literally within minutes. Uh, in most cases, the heat will not affect you that quickly or at all. Even in like 90 degree temperatures, if you find a shady spot and have enough to water to drink, you can lay around outside all day and be perfectly fine. Actually, you'd be quite pleasant. I get it. You're underplaying the facts of heat-related deaths with your analogy, but you are mostly correct. 
more people do die and will continue to die by extreme colds for quite some time. Where the Lancet would probably warn about dismissing heat would be that age doesn't play as important of a role with heat-related deaths, and it escalates very quickly as the temperature rises, even a little. Small changes then could be far more impactful to the entire population than a few more degrees of cold. But yes, we are a long ways away from that, perhaps, to having deaths being equal. You pull ahead, Matt. Talk to me about liberals. What are we being alarmist about with climate change? Our public health establishment, meanwhile, wants to use climate change to explain away the next fake pandemic, which they can use to gain even more control over your life. Here's the TV expert, Dr. Peter Hotez, explaining that climate change could be responsible for the next COVID. Watch. Why are we seeing so many pandemics? It's one of the most common questions I've asked is it's a confluence of 21st century forces. Um, a big one is climate change, which is altering the migration of uh, animals that can transmit these uh, viral pathogens. Yes, we're experiencing pandemics. Good thing they didn't experience pandemics back, you know, historically. Like all those people during the Black Death. Uh, there's, so the, the pandemics are a new thing because of climate change. Peter Hotez goes into a lot more detail in the full video that you clipped from, but so do the articles about this. Climate change is having a real impact on the migration patterns of various animals, especially birds, that transmit a great deal of diseases to humans. This is a new <sighs> phenomenon, and it would be something that a disease expert should be concerned with, regardless of their political affiliation. It's not the source of the disease, of course. It's the reason why pandemics are increasing in rates of occurrence, which are gone over in various studies outside of Peter Hotez. This brings us back to being tied. What about greenhouse emissions? What's silly there? To that end, the Department of Agriculture in Ireland recently considered a plan to kill 200,000 cows to reduce emissions. So they're thinking about literal animal sacrifice to save the climate. Even though, by the climate alarmist on standards, by the way, I Ireland barely emits any CO2 in the atmosphere at all in comparison to many other countries. Ouch, Matt, your lead was short. Ireland's EPA talked about this plan to reduce overall greenhouse gases. Which gases? Not CO2. Nitrous oxide from fertilizer and manure management and methane that is emitted by livestock. But again, not CO2. And their CO2 emissions, just by the by, do rank pretty close to and exceed many other EU countries. But I won't ding you on that part because you didn't state which specific countries you were looking at. Again, smart move. All right, Matt, the totals are in. Before we get there, if there was something you'd want to conclude on, what would be that? point that we can leave with our viewers. Now, if there's any distinction between climate alarmists and most cultists, it's that you can only string most cultists along for so long. Historically, most cults, at least most apocalyptic cults, disband once the cult predicts a doomsday and gives a specific date, then the date passes without any asteroid impact or anything like that. But the climate cult is different. They can make prediction after prediction, and even though they're all wrong, they get to keep making more predictions. They get to keep flying in private jets to climate conferences where they lecture us on how to behave, what cars to drive, what food to eat, what stoves to use, and so on. In the meantime, the corporate press will defend them. A reporter for Axios uh, recently responding to criticism that um, all of these private jets might harm the environment wrote this on social media, quote, To all those complaining about world leaders flying to attend a meeting on climate change, you're not saying anything original. Fact is, you can't do a Zoom call with 190 countries, and face-to-face -face talks move the needle the most. The actual reporter never explains why a big Zoom call wouldn't be possible exactly. He also never explains why some of these world leaders can't fly on commercial planes. You're just supposed to accept it, because ultimately, they have the power and you don't, and that's the actual explanation. You know, that is an interesting take there on apocalyptic cults. And because we've become friends, I won't point out how that may feel a little anti your own religion. I want to say, genuinely, despite our differences in accuracy when it comes to climate change, I agree that it is hypocritical for these folks not to fly on commercial airliners, not to use more Zoom call type things, and instead fly private. Not even business, but private 
like we said before, that doesn't win them any points in my book. Matt, it was great having you on, but are you dumber than a liberal? The answer would be yes, where the facts easily researched speak for themselves. And I hope to have you back on. If you'd like to be on Are You Dumber Than a Liberal, then all you need to do is record a video of you explaining your claims. Upload that to YouTube and comment with the link below. If you'd rather stay out of the limelight, totally understandable. Why don't you find a person who presents claims you think I disagree with to find out if they are dumber than a liberal? No need to restrict yourself to just conservatives. If you think I got something wrong in this video, go ahead and put it in the comments with the reason why a particular claim was inaccurate. See you next time. Whew, I really need to go get myself an almond milk latte, triple shot, extra hot, minimal foam. Yeah. Sounds good.